You're listening to the 2011 Hungarian Grand Prix podcast on Formula One Fancast. To keep up to date with the latest Formula One news, visit www.formulaonefancast.com and you can follow us on Twitter at Formula One Fancast. Well, one driver, no doubt, every team would love to have driving for them to deal with changeable conditions is Jensen Button. The 2009 world champion took his second victory of the season with a superb drive at the Hungaro ring. Red Bull Sebastian Vettel finished second and Ferrari's Fernando Alonso once again finished on the podium as he finished third. And Will Vincent is here with me to review the Hungarian Grand Prix weekend. How are you, Will? I'm not bad. Well, before the first free practice session at the Hungaro Ring, all of us woke up to the news that from 2012, Sky Sports will be televising each Formula One weekend, including all the free practice and qualifying sessions, as well as the races. BBC TV will only be providing coverage of 10 races, although BBC Radio 5 Live will continue to cover all the races live. Uh, will, so much for Formula One supposed to be a free-to-air sport, and without question, uh, the move to Sky is devastating for news for many Formula One fans. It's shocking. Um, I mean, first of all, I can understand part of the reason why BBC um, felt they couldn't keep up with their current deal package, because obviously they're having to cut a lot of stuff here, there and everywhere. But still, there are other options. I mean, Bernie was talking in Autosport a few weeks back, you know, considering going, for example, to Channel 5. There could have been a situation, for example, where they could have had half a season on BBC, half a season on ITV, Channel 4, Channel 5, something like that. That would have been perfectly fine. No one would have minded the adverts in that case. But the fact that you've got to pay, well, I worked it out, to be £45 a month if you want to understand the definition, £60 a month if you want it in high definition, to watch what will be on average two races a month, you could pretty much almost go to a Grand Prix for that money that we're spending over the course of a year. It's, it's absolutely pathetic. Well, this was part of an article I came across on the 18th of July on the ESPN Formula 1 website. Uh, this is what it said. Eccleston added that a mooted move for Murdoch's pay TV networks to take over the broadcasting of Formula 1 was unlikely due to the BBC's existing contract. And this is a quote from Bernie. Uh, Let's wait and see about the BBC because at the minute they want to make a noise. I can't see how the BBC could cancel. We could probably sue them. It is impossible that Formula One could go on to pay TV. We wouldn't want to do that. It, you know, Will, it's just amazing what difference a couple of weeks make. And I've already spoken to many Formula One fans, and they've said that they will not be subscribing to Sky. Will, do you think Bernie Eccleston is losing the plot? I don't think he's losing the plot. I just think he's actually just figured out how much money he can still milk out of Formula One. I mean, there's very few countries that actually has, you know... Formula 1 being shown on more than one channel at a time, and I know Germany's one of them. Um, but the fact that he's managed to get himself not one TV deal, but two deals, essentially, he's still a shrewd business character, but I think he's forgetting more and more about the fans that make Formula 1 one of the most watched sports in the world in the first place. Well, it's bad enough fans not being able to go to Grand Prix, and now for them to have to pay to watch uh, Formula 1 is ridiculous, isn't it? Absolutely ridiculous full stop end of story I think Bernie's got a lot of explaining to do over the coming months um, as to why he decided to do this deal um, and also people forget as well is that come 2018 as Sky are very good at doing all they'll need all they'll do is outbid the BBC and then they'll have all the Formula 1 outright and then Formula 1 come 2019 won't be on free to air TV at all and we saw in 2009 the majority of Formula 1 teams playing a breakaway series, but the FIA and teams were then able to come up with a deal in which those teams would remain in the sport. Could you see something similar happening this time with the TV rights? Yes and no. Um, the biggest issue is always and always will be TV rights in the first place. Um, and then from the TV rights, you need to get the sponsors involved, you need to get the tracks involved. And, I mean, the FIA could very easily go, for example, to all the Grand Prix tracks and say, OK, if you host a race of this other series, we're not going to let you host a Formula 1 Grand Prix. And essentially, at the same time, if you go back to um, American, motor, American Open Wheel Racing, they had a similar thing in 1996, where um, they formed a breakaway series, and one did really well for the first few years, but you just see how difficult it is to keep two series competitive when competing with each other. And essentially, at the end of the day, probably both of them will fail. 
Well, we could go on for hours talking about this, but we are here to review the Hungarian Grand Prix and will another exciting Grand Prix we were all treated to. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, and it goes to show as well, you know, when Button actually manages to get his qualifying sorted out, he can be a race contender. And after DNFs at Silverstone and a Nürburgring, Jensen Button certainly bounced back in fine style at the Hungara Ring in his 200th start in Formula 1. And once again, he proved he is the master of changeable conditions. Why, Will, do you think he's so good in those conditions? Um, I mean, we've heard the stories about how his dad refused to buy him rain tyres and all that. I think it's just a lot more simple than that. His driving style is very, very smooth. And that means that when you are in these changeable conditions, you're not trying to put too much pressure on the car to make the corner. He's very good at keeping lines, lap after lap after lap, so he won't go into the wet part of the track. And also, he's very good, obviously, on the flip side of that, of managing those, for example, those intermediate tyres, so he doesn't get as much of a fall off as some of the other drivers does. Well, Jensen had some great tussles with his team at Lewis Hamilton, and barring the Canadian Grand Prix this year, uh, both McLaren drivers proved yet again they can race each other without causing a collision. Well, yeah, um, especially when we had that quick shower towards the end of the race. Um, I mean, in fact, I think they overtook each other about three times in one lap there. That was something really special to watch, actually. Um, and, yeah, it just shows that if you put your trust in the two guys not to run into each other, chances are they won't. And you said last week that Button needs to qualify in the top four to at least stand a chance of winning races. Well, he did that this week, and he needs to now do that on a regular basis from now till the end of the season, doesn't he? Well, yeah. I mean, luckily for Jensen, I think there's a number of tracks which he's historically been very good at. Um, for example, Spa, Monza, Suzuka, Brazil. They're all tracks that he is really, really good at and really good at driving at. Um, I think he just needs to keep focused more than anything. It's, uh, it almost seems too much at the time he's trying to go for pole position when he probably can't go for pole position. But going for third or fourth from the grid is something that's a lot more attainable for him. And if he just aims for that, then more likely he's likely to succeed. But let's take nothing away from Jensen. A great win and a result he needed after what happened at Silverstone and in Germany. Yeah, he definitely needed to bounce back. And this was the way to do it. I think the McLaren boys over the last two races have shown that they can contend to race victories and if they can put together a good rest of the season can claw back some of that advantage that Vettel currently has. Well hindsight is a beautiful thing and had Lewis Hamilton not served to drive through and not gone on to the intermediate on lap 55 it might well have been him who won the race. Lewis in the end finished fourth and no doubt would have been frustrated to finish outside the top three but Will, uh, Hamilton can be pleased with the fact that McLaren have made significant improvements in the last two races. Not only that, the fact that he had a drive through penalty, was on the wrong side at the wrong time, um, and still finished fourth. I mean, that was damage limitation there at its very best. Um, the fact that they were able to do that alone is a positive for McLaren. The fact that he had such good raw pace for most of the race was very good for him and for McLaren. And it did look like they had the edge on Red Bull not only in the wet but in the dry as well. And when Hamilton did come in for the intermediate, it, it was still running, so I suppose you could understand why he went on to those tyres when there were other drivers who were coming in for intermediates as well. Well, yeah, um, again, it was the case of, well, who's going to blink, who's going to blink when? Um, and I think they were just reacting to what Red Bull were doing and what a few other teams were doing. Um, however, I don't think anyone expected the shower to not last that long. And also, I don't think they expected it to be confined to just the one part of the track either. Was the drive through the right decision? Yes. Um, I hate to say it, but I think it was. Um, at the end of the day, had Paul de Resta not have been um, so quick to react, we would have had a Fourth India and a McLaren sitting inside of a wall somewhere. And he certainly gave a mature and professional interview, a uh, post-race interview, I should say, with uh, Lee McKenzie afterwards. Well, yeah, um, I think he, you know, he accepted what he did, wasn't necessarily the best thing. I mean, at the same time, when you're in a drive and you spin the car, the first thing you're going to do is get back, you know, all four wheels facing the right direction and go again, especially if you're trying to compete for the race win. However, I think in hindsight, he would have just waited those two little seconds, flipped the car around, and it would have saved him overall a good 20 seconds in the race. 
Well, coming on to Red Bull, and uh, Sebastian Vettel finished the race behind Jensen Button in second. And despite uh, not winning the race, Vettel was able to extend his lead in the driver's uh, and will, unless he has a couple of retirements and mechanical failures. It's difficult to see uh, Vettel losing his 80-plus points lead in the driver's standings. You say that, however, Red Bull's reliability this year has been very, very touch and go. Um, and I think there's two issues we need to deal with here. Once again, we saw Vettel make a mistake when put under pressure um, by Hamilton. And the second one is, I mean, it's all these little issues so far. It's been the DRS hasn't been working here or there. The curves haven't been working here or there. You know, the brakes a little bit. Sometimes they have to lean the engine out a little bit. I think that as Ferrari and McLaren become more competitive, and more pressure's put upon Red Bull, there's a very strong chance of them starting to show a lot more cracks. But you could argue now, all uh, Vettel's got to do now is finish consistently in the points. Well, yeah, I mean, you can always, you know, just do the easy way, race for a championship. Pretty much that's what Boston was able to do in his championship one year. But I don't think, A, that's Vettel's style. I think, you know, he wants to get every pole position he can. He wants to get every fastest lap he can. He wants to win every race he can. Um... And at the same time, obviously, once you start racing for points, uh, you know, racing for a championship, there's always that issue of, okay, what happens if you retire from a fifth place? Or what happens if you pushed a little bit harder in this race? You might have got a few more points, which all of a sudden becomes vital. Uh, it's a very dangerous game trying to race for a championship, and I don't think that Vettel's going to be trying to do that any point soon. But it was another frustrating weekend for Mark Webber as he came up in fifth. Uh, a difficult weekend for the Australian, and this time round he was unable to challenge for the win. Yeah, um, again, a strange weekend for Webber. Um, I think he's getting more and more flummoxed in that car every week that goes by. Um, it seems to be that even if it's the Ferraris and McLarens beating Seb, he's always behind him himself he's never really put in that many performances this season where he's actually said okay I am the fastest guy in the Red Bull Garage this weekend and the more races that go by that he can't do that the more it looks like he's not going to be staying in Formula 1 much longer as far as I'm concerned and I suppose the break you could say has come at a good time for Mark it's come at a crucial time um, he absolutely needs to go Spend a few weeks, regroup, get himself together for Spa because it's going to be a key race. And if he doesn't put in an absolutely blinding performance at Spa, he might as well just, you know, make that number two on the front of his car, a literal thing. Well, it wasn't the strongest of weekends for Ferrari as Fernando Alonso finished the race third with his teammate Felipe Massa coming home in sixth. But uh, will Alonso on the podium yet again? Yeah. And this is where Ferrari is going to be so strong at the end of the season, how they can still get podiums even when they're not at their very best. Um, and I think Alonso was on the back foot this race, obviously the first time that Massa's outperformed him in qualifying all year. Um, but he managed to bounce back from that. He drove a very strong and solid race, which um, we've come to expect from Fernando so much. And I think in some ways, having such a difficult start to the season has kind of focused his determination so much more and he's gone from whining and moaning about everything to just getting the job done, getting the points in the bag and he really could still be a factor coming into this season. And based on what we saw in free practice and in qualifying, do you think third was the best result Ferrari could have achieved? Yes. Um, Ferrari never seemed to be that good uh, ever since Michael left with the wet dry weather strategies. Um, so that alone puts him slightly in the back foot and I think this track wasn't one that was going to suit Ferrari anyway and I think they knew that uh, historically this has always been a track that McLaren's been good at anyway just because obviously the way they build their cars um, but the fact that again they still managed to come out of a podium from it it was a lot of damage limitation then there from Alonso and he managed to sustain to some effect the gap point between him and Seb. And you just mentioned that uh, Felipe Massa air qualified his teammate for the first time this year. Uh, that'll be a massive uh, boost uh, for Massa's confidence, won't it, for qualifying? Well, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think there's no doubt about it. Massa's not going to be 
contesting the championship this year. Um, but he needs to not only show that he can help take points away from Red Bull to help Alonso in the championship hunt, he also needs to show that he can be the match of Alonso as well, because the last thing he's going to want is to spend another few seasons as a number two driver. And this is really now it is his chance when all Ferrari are wanting to get his race wins and put as many points as they can between them and Red Bull. Massa just needs to go out there and drive the car like there's no tomorrow. Well, last time out in Germany, it was Adrian Sutil who brought home the points for Force India, but in Hungary, Paul Di Resta finished Sunday's race 7th and picked up 6 crucial points. Sutil finished the race 14th despite qualifying 8th. Uh, well, a great effort from Di Resta, and it was about time he had some luck. Well, yeah, it seems to be always that one of the um, one of the Force Indias do really well and the other one doesn't. I don't know what it is, but <clears throat> I don't think they managed to get many double point finishes for some reason. But yeah, a great race for Duresta. Um Again, he's very lucky that he was able to react well to that incident when Hamilton spun. Um, and I think it's another strong, solid drive from him. And this is, as I said to you before, all he needs to do, just have those strong, solid drives. And whilst he keeps doing those, the chances for him are going to look so much better for this season and next and beyond. And those six points saw Force India edge ever closer to Sauber in the Constructors. Well, yeah, and bragging white rights of that position is going to be highly contested come the end of the season. I mean, I'm I'm highly surprised that Sauber's being able to keep up the pace that they've been able to. Obviously, they weren't as good this weekend. But <clears throat> I think, you know, between Force India, Sauber, your Mercedes and your Williamses, I think Force India is the best team but I don't think they've been able to bring a complete package to a weekend so far with both drivers. And as soon as they do that, then they've got a very good shot of taking that position away. And obviously they're going to go to Spa next, which historically they've had so much good luck at. Well, Sauber have announced Kamui Kobayashi and Sergio Perez as their drivers uh, for next year. Uh, Toro Rosso had both of their drivers picking up points in Hungary. Sebastian Buemi started the race 23rd but came through the field and put in a fine performance to finish 8th. Jaime Algaswari once again came home in the top 10 and the Spaniard picked up the final point in 10th. And Will, great result for the team to mark their 100th race in Formula 1 and a superb drive from Sebastian Buemi. Yes, um, good race for Toro Rosso. Showing again, you know, that whilst the memory of Monardi lives on through that team, they have improved so much and come from being a back-end team to consistently trying to fight for those midfield spots. And Al has done a, a really good job this year. He's been really under-noticed and underrated, but he's done such a good job of, you know, keeping it on the island and just racking up those race finishes, getting the points done. Same with Ambrosio. And... I think that everything that Toro Rosso was designed to be, they're doing to perfection. And I just wish that, I just hope that they're doing this one in a hundred races time. Do you expect Buemi and Algo Suari to be at Toro Rosso next year? Yes. In all honesty, I'm not sure either one of them is of the quality and calibre to jump into a Red Bull seat at the minute, which is obviously where the natural progression should be from Toro Rosso to Red Bull. But I think that they both do their jobs very well at Toro Rosso um, and they're learning more each day, they're doing the team prowls and I think they should both be there next year. OK, well Nico Rosberg finished the race ninth for Mercedes and we saw in the race Jerome D'Ambrosio have a moment in the pit lane. Uh, we're a luckiest game not only for him but for the team personnel at both Mauricio Virgin and HRT. I never actually seen something like that happen in the pits in the Formula 1 race, ever. It's probably one of the most surreal things I've seen since um, Coulthard whacked the tyre barriers at 95 Adelaide um, coming into pit lane. But yeah, first of all, um, happy 100th Grand Prix as well to Nico Rosberg. He's been around for exactly the same time as those horrible V8 engines. But yeah, good race from Rosberg to some extent, um, and good race from D'Ambrosio as well. Well, as all the Formula 1 teams have a well-deserved break, myself and Will are going to give a brief half-time report on all the teams and give them a mark out of 10, so 1 being the worst and 10 being the best. So we'll start with Red Bull. Uh, Will, marks out of 10 for Red Bull? I'll give him an 8. Um, 
I'm giving them an 8 just because of the fact that had they not had so many issues with their curves, their DRS, or other niggling issues, they could have had possibly both the championships almost wrapped up by now. And coming on to McLaren? McLaren, um, I don't know. They've started off very badly, but they've got better and better and better. And for that, I'll give them an 8 again. Well, I think, McLaren, I think McLaren, considering where they were in pre-season and uh, the struggles they had at Silverstone and in the European Grand Prix, I think McLaren have had a good, solid season. And the uh, last two races have seen McLaren win uh, both races. Um, hopefully, uh, from a British perspective, the British fans, uh, hopefully we'll see some more McLaren wins come the end of the season. Uh, coming on to Ferrari, uh, marks out a 10 for them? Um, Ferrari, I don't know. I'll give them a 7.5, I'll say. I mean... They clearly have been the third best team for most of the year. I mean, but what's in Ferrari's favour is that they can always be there. They never really have that many bad weekends. It's always average weekends for them. Actually, I was supposed to be, I forgot, I was supposed to be giving marks, wasn't I? Uh, I'll give eight for Red Bull. Um, it's an eight also for McLaren. Uh, Ferrari, I mean, another slow start like they... Um, Again, like last year, but uh, no, since Monaco, Ferrari have been gaining some good momentum. Uh, I'm also going to give Ferrari an 8. Uh, coming on to the midfield teams now, uh, Will, uh, Mark's out of 10 for Mercedes? Um, there were so many expectations for Mercedes coming to the season. You know, Schumacher was saying, oh, we're going to contend for podium, potentially race wind. But it's been another disappointing season for them. Yes, they've got so much better than they have last year, but... The amount of resources they have, the people they have on board, they really should be doing so much better. And for that, I'm just going to have to give them a five. I'm sorry. Well, like you said, Will, uh, Mercedes, a lot of expectation, um, but unfortunately, um, they've been unable to deliver. Uh, despite Michael Schumacher, he put, I know he put in a strong performance uh, in Canada to finish fourth. Uh, yes, perhaps, you know, conditions played a part in that. But uh, no, I'm, I'm sure Mercedes will be hoping for a stronger second half of the season, so I'm going to give them a six. Uh, coming on to Renault. Um, Renault, um, again, a nice solid season for them. Come to almost be what we expected from them for the last few years. Uh, I'm going to give them a six. Well, let's not forget Renault uh, scored uh, podiums in the first two races. I think it was Petrov in Australia and uh, Heidfeld in Malaysia, I think it was. Um, yeah, I think Renault since then have uh, faded somewhat and they've been dragged back into the midfield battle and I'm sure Eric Bouye will be expecting better in the second half so I'm, I'm actually going to give Renault a 6 uh, moving on to Williams now um, really disappointed by Williams yet again um, I don't know what it is but Frank um, and Patrick Head really need to start sorting something out of that team because otherwise they're going to start losing many more sponsors and they're not going to be around for much longer if they don't start getting results. Um, but at the same time, I admire their their passion and their courage and the fact that they've done what they've done for so long. I mean, they are essentially the last of the privateers. Um, I'll give them a five. Well, it's been a disappointing year for Williams, isn't it? Um, you know, they both drivers, Rubens Barrichello and Pastor Maldonado, will have been expecting better. Uh, I still... Still cannot understand why Williams let uh, Nico Hulkenberg go, but uh, I suppose money nowadays does the talking. Uh, I'm going to give Williams a 5. Uh, Mark's at a 10 for Force India, Will? Force India are one of my teams of the year this year, actually. Um, <clears throat> just because they've got a much less budget than some of the guys around them, but still managed to produce some amazing results. They've got two really good drivers, you know, got a good old horse in Sutil, got the new guy in the rest, so I'm going to have to give them a 7. I really think Force India will be the team to watch out for in the second half of the season. The last two races have uh, been very strong in both qualifying and in the race. Uh, picked up some crucial points and they've got closer to Salby and the constructors. Uh, I'm going to give Force India a 7. I think they're coming on, they'll come on strong this year. Uh, second half of the season, I should say. Uh, Salva, marks out a 10 for them. Salva will get a 6 from me. Um, they've done well, again. They've everything what I've come to expect from Salva. I think the only issue is is that they don't have their traditional second half of the season drop off. Well, for me personally, I think Sauber have uh, exceeded their expectations. I think uh, both Kamui Kobayashi and Sergio Perez have done a great job so far. Um, I'm going to give them a seven. I think both drives are uh, drives to watch out for in the future. Uh, coming on to Toro Rosso now. 
Um, so so I'm going to give them a six again. They've done, you know, well. They've been solid. Um, they haven't been the best of the midfield teams, but they've been there, thereabouts, around there, racking up points, being consistent, being reliable. No issues on them. <clears throat> I'm going to give Toro Rosso a six. Uh, now, coming on to the relatively new teams now, uh, to mark that a ten for Team Lotus? I don't get what happened with Carver Kane still last week. Um, sorry, Shandok even. Yeah, um, and I still don't get what the whole issue has been with their power two steering situation and why they haven't been able to, you know, sort that out for truly for so long. But at the same time, they are, in my opinion, the best of those three new teams, um, and they are the one that if I think any of them is going to break into the midfield anytime soon, it's going to be them. So I'll give them a four. Well, well, Team Lotus in uh, in qualifying in Hungary weren't actually weren't far away from Williams. I uh, was uh, very impressed with both uh, Trulli and uh, Kovalainen. I mean, yes, the race team goes plan. Uh, two retirees for both uh, for the Lotus team, but uh, no, pl- I've seen plenty of encouraging signs for Lotus this year. And uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna give them a six because I think they've come a long way, and I could actually see them uh, sneaking some points come the end of the season. Uh, coming on to Marussia Virgin. Um, this is where I start to say the word disappointing all the time. Um, being disappointing, um, they've improved, but they've not improved at the rate of the teams are around them, especially at the top of the grid. So that's why they're stuck where they are. Um, and they still have these niggling reliability issues all the time. I'm going to give them three. I'm sorry. I just haven't. I expected them to do slightly better than they have this season. Well, I think Virgin, along with Williams, I think they've been one of the, um, the underachievers of this year. Uh, great news about Timo Glock. Um, he's, he'll be staying at Marussia Virgin for the next, well, next couple of years, I think. Um, but uh, Virgin, still not... I mean, they would have liked to have been closer to the midfield like uh, Lotus, but Virgin can't even get close to Lotus uh, at the minute. Um, it's been a disappointing year for them. Um, I'm going to give Virgin a 5. And finally, coming on to HRT. Um, the only team not to qualify for a Grand Prix um, in the last God knows how long. Um, there have been some ever so slightly ups, but there have been a lot of downs as well. Um, the fact that you can still um, have your logo on the side of their car speaks so much about that team and how little money I'm sure they're working off, which in some ways... I'm going to have to mark them slightly up because they, they must have absolutely no money at all between what they're doing. They've hardly got any sponsors on the car or anything. But at the same time, this is Formula 1. And, you know, if they couldn't get together the packages that they were going to get, they should never have applied to be one of those three teams to come in when there could have been other teams that, you know, could have got the job done. And for that, I'm going to give them a very nice free. Uh, I think HRT, you know, considering you know the financial difficulties, um, I think they've done pretty well. I mean, there've been times where you know they've been even beating Virgin as well. I mean, that's I mean that's a good achievement for them. Uh, I'm going to give HRT a five, and you know they've got a good driver in Daniel Ricciardo. Uh, I think Luzzi, obviously, he brings the experience to that to you know, to that team. Um, I think HRT, yeah, I think they could finish again above Virgin and the constructors yet again. Uh, but will. Thank you very much for coming in to review the Hungarian Grand Prix. Uh, if you want to have your say on the Hungarian Grand Prix, you can do so by sending us a tweet to at Formula One Fancast on my personal page at Baggies20. Uh, you can also post your comments on our Facebook page, uh, Formula One Fancast. And don't forget, you can keep up to date with the latest Formula One news by visiting www.formulaonefancast.com. From me and Will, cheerio.